Hey everybody at Grace. Uh, man, I am sorry for the technical difficulties on Zoom uh, today. So I am coming to you live from Facebook and um, we will uh, just do our best uh, today. So we are in Acts chapter 8 and um, we just finished um, showing Paul um, coming into the picture uh, as Stephen was being uh, stoned to death. And now it says in chapter 8, uh, Saul approves of this execution. He's right there. He's watching everything. And um, it says, there arose in chapter 8, verse 1, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. It says, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entered the, the house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So he is taking joy in all of the difficulties and challenges that the church is, is going through. And so people are scattering. And, and what's crazy about persecution is this is typically what happens. Um, when the church becomes persecuted, uh, it may scatter the people in. And at first it may seem that all hope is lost. But, but what God does through persecution is He grows His church. That's what, what happens. And so uh, Philip is going down uh, in, in chapter 8 uh, to the city. He's um, um, there and, and he's doing all kinds of things. It says in verse 7, unclean spirits are crying out with a loud voice. Uh, they came out of people. People are paralyzed. People are being healed. And so what's happening? There's much joy in the city, it says. And this is an awesome thing. And so then all of a sudden there's this new guy that enters into the picture and his name is Simon. And he was this magician. And you could almost say he was doing like uh, uh, dark magic of some kind. Uh, he was not at this time uh, a Christian. He did not believe. And what happens is um, he is um, amazed the people, uh, he amazed all the people saying he himself was somebody great. So that's kind of a problem, right? He's saying, hey, uh, hey, watch all this magic. Do, 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 You know, and he's doing all these things and they're saying um, that he's somebody great and says they pay attention to him. Um, and it says, this man is the power of God that is called great. Um, they were amazed with his magic. It says, but when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God, they were baptized, both men and women. So there is this magician. They're really um, in awe of him. And now Philip comes along. He preaches the gospel. And men and women around believe. Um, even Simon himself, it says, believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, Get this, the magician who was amazed, uh, was amazing people, is now amazed himself. Um, and so here's what's interesting is obviously this magician, Simon, was not a uh, Christian at the time, uh, but he was practicing this magic. And a, a commentator says, you know, Satan, uh, true or false question, Satan is against religion. Well, the answer is uh, false. He's not opposed to religion uh, because he's in the religion business up to his ears, this commentator says. The first temptation was a religious one, to be like God. Uh, and um, it was uh, then uh, Satan's chief weapon, this commentator says, against the gospel is false religion. Uh, God's been working in power and now here comes a com uh, conflict here uh, in Acts. And so, you know, the devil will try to get people to 
not believe in Christ in whatever way he can. And that's what he was doing with this magician. He was even doing this with Simon himself because as we, we go further along, it says he was amazed. Um, and, uh, you know, these people but believed uh, Philip, but now uh, you see Simon. Uh, he starts to amaze, be amazed. And then in verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent Peter and John down. Um, and then they, they laid hands on people. They received the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 18, it talks about Simon. When Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in verse 13, um, commentators are a little confused or they struggle with whether Simon, when it says he was amazed, that he actually believed in Christ at this point. For example, my study Bible says about verse 13, when it says Simon was amazed, the Lord's miracles and the convincing power of the gospel converted even Simon, who then accompanied Philip by heeding his teaching or supporting his work. However, other commentaries that I read say um, some believe this is false faith exhibited by Simon. Others believe his faith is genuine. Well, Verse 13, it kind of sees, before you read 18, it kind of seems like, okay, well, he's amazed. Usually when people are amazed at the teachings of Christ, they, they believe, they, they really have faith. But then when you get to verse 18 and it says they're offering, he's offering the apostles money, you start going, uh, okay, Simon, like, what's your goal? Well, we see what happens here. He says, hey, I'm going to give you money uh, so that I can have this power also. Um, please give me this power also so anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So I want to do what you're doing, and, and I want to lay my hands on people so they may receive the power um, and so here's what's really interesting uh, about this um, as Simon's doing this. Um, it, it really becomes um, about him. Um, everyone whom I lay my hands on receives the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, hey, give this power to me so that, you know, I, I can... Uh, be used by God, uh, be used as a vessel of Christ. Um, and, and remember in, in Acts so far, a lot of the, uh, the apostles are saying that. They're not saying, I have this power. They're saying, it's because of Christ working in and through me. And that's a difference with Simon here. Uh, and so Peter scolds him here. Uh, he says, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Um, and so, basically, Peter is very st uh, strong with Simon here. He's basically saying, you know what? Forget you and your money. You need to repent. You need to turn from this, because right now, you were sinning against God. And, and this is not the way we do things. I mean, Peter is really calling him out. And Peter has always never had a problem opening in his mouth. So it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that he's calling Simon out here. Uh, Simon looked like the real deal uh, here at first. Uh, but um, he, he had some learning to do. And isn't that how we are as followers of Jesus? We may, we'll be baptized as infants. We'll, we'll be, um, our parents will disciple us. Teachers will disciple us. Sunday school teachers, pastors will disciple us. But there's still things that, that God needs to work uh, out in our hearts, right? 
the word is still working. We still need to go to Jesus. It's, it's wrong when people say things like this, and I've heard it a lot uh, in my life. Oh, I was confirmed. I was baptized as a Christian, as a believer, as a child. I, I don't need to know any more than that. And you're like, what? What? I, that, that's not the way it goes. And so Peter's saying, hey, it doesn't really matter if you've been baptized and all this stuff when you still are making everything about you. You're still, um, you don't understand that the power is not from you, it's from God. And that's a lesson for us too, that, that hey, meet people where they're at. As I preached about this today, all of us don't have it together all the time. And so let's use compassion. Let's call it out like Peter did. But notice what he said. He said, repent, repent, like turn from this. Um, and Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come to me. So here's what Simon's doing. He is asking Peter, like he, he's confessing right here. Like, yeah, I... I need, I need forgiveness. Please intercede on my behalf. Um, I, I admit, um, it seems to, to be that. Now, again, that's the way I read it, yet I look at commentaries, and it seems to indicate, um, well, he still really hasn't, you know, isn't for, um, isn't sorry. He's not repentant. Yet again, the Lutheran Study Bible says, unlike Ananias and Sapphira, Simon immediately asked Peter in his seat on his behalf to remove the curse. So, like, which one is it? I tend to err on the side of grace. I, I think it appears to me Simon is saying, intercede on my behalf because... I don't want this to be the case. If that is where he's at, then as a pastor, if somebody used that language with me, I would, now I would probe more if somebody was in front of me saying these things. But I would also kind of go, you know what? This guy seems like he's sorry. He's not saying, forget you, Peter. I'm not sorry for this, whatever. So I think some of the commentators are reading a little bit into this when you can't ask Simon himself, it seems to indicate if somebody's asking you to prevent this, they don't want this to happen. It may be, it could be um, fear, like, hey, I don't, I don't want this to happen. I don't want this to be. The case. But the reality is it could also be he's really sorry. So which is it? I, I wish for certain I could tell you. Um, this is just one of those things I, I don't know, you know, and... Um, I, I am a pastor who's not afraid to say that because I, I've researched it and it goes both ways. So um, you have to kind of make your own um, own um, kind of uh, decision on, on what happened with Simon this magician. As far as I'm aware, we don't really uh, hear from him uh, much more uh, after this. So now we go to verse 26, if you're with me, and uh, it's great to have y'all y'all here. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties on Zoom. Seems to be a, have been happening for the last three hours or so, and I didn't know that until I tried to log on. So, um, But we are in chapter 8, verse 26, and now we, we hit a story that, that is in our uh, lectionary readings. Um, you've probably heard it if you are in church, if you're a follower of Christ. If not, it's a, it's a great story to uh, just hear even for the first time. And in verse 26, there's Philip and this Ethiopian, Ethiopian, easy for me to say, eunuch. And <clears throat> here's what's happening. Uh, an angel of the Lord comes to Philip. That would freak you out, right? If uh, an angel came to you. And this is what happens to Philip. It says, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. 
And so here's what's happening. Philip, this eunuch, or Philip and the eunuch, are, are there. An angel tells him to go to him. Um, and so um, here's what's going on as he's led by this angel to this eunuch. Um, a commentator states, The Spirit first directed Philip through persecution to leave his ministry in Jerusalem and go to Samaria for a much wider ministry. Philip knew by experience God directs by difficulties, but he did not believe that is the only way God leads. Next, Philip is led by an angel. <clears throat> and so, this um, he's asked, Philip is asked to go to, to see this eunuch. And it says, and he rose and went. And throughout Acts, we see a lot of obedience to God's word, God's command. When he says, go somewhere, for the most part, they just, they, they go, they go. And um, this is another situation. And so he says, here's this eunuch. And now the spirit is speaking um, to Philip again as he encounters this eunuch reading the prophet of Isaiah. And he says, hey, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him, it says, heard him reading Isaiah. And so he says "Hey," to this eunuch, hey, uh, do you understand what you are reading? And he says, well, um, I mean, how can I understand unless he guides me? And so he invited Philip to come up and sit like, hey, I have no idea what it's saying, man. Can you come up and can you, you sit with me? and try to figure this out. Now, first of all, let's talk about, before we get too deep, what's a eunuch? Maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't. A eunuch is, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll be uh, censored on, on Facebook Live. I have no idea. But a eunuch is a guy usually who, had, who has been castrated. Um, this was um, due to... Um, um, uh, eunuchs, uh, this was done so that, um, man, I'm trying to remember. I feel like that was done so that the, the other people, whenever they're in the courts and they're with the, the royalty and all of the, the people, that they wouldn't try to do something with the, the, the queens or, or something like that. They knew if they didn't have the tools to do that, they wouldn't do it. And so, um, now, the thing about this eunuch, or any eunuch, is it doesn't necessarily mean that that was the case for, for this eunuch. Not all eunuchs uh, were um, missing their parts, so to speak. Um, so, but he was a eunuch in the sense of his role. Uh, and it says in, in commentaries, he appears to be the first fully Gentile convert to Christianity. Um, and, and so that's pretty pretty interesting thing. Um, so he's reading Isaiah. Um, it doesn't really say what he's reading, just that, that he's, he's reading. Uh, but then, it, at first, it doesn't say that. But in verse 32, it does show us what he's reading. Um, you know, like a sheep who was led to a slaughter, like a lamb before his shear is silent. I mean, this is, um, let me see if I can find it in my, my Bible, what, what verses this is. I am not able to find it offhand. Uh, it's Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. And uh, so that's what he's reading. Um, and the eunuch says to Philip, um, whom does the prophet say about, about this, about himself or about someone else um, and so he starts telling him and Philip opens his mouth and he starts telling him about Christ um, this is great and so he starts telling him about Jesus and about his love and grace and it says in verse 36 and as they were going along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said hey there's some water what prevents me from uh, being uh, baptized. Well, let's step back a little bit. The eunuch's reading Isaiah. 
he doesn't necessarily understand the book of what he's reading. And he says, hey, how, how can I understand this unless someone helps me? It's a cry out to help, to help him. The worst thing that Philip could have done has been like, yeah, I don't know. I guess somebody will have to help you. I'm really busy. Hey, man, I got to go. I don't have time. But what did he do? He sat, he sat down with him in his chariot. As I talked about again today, he met him where he is at. And he sat there to, to, he, to just not describe what he was hearing about in Isaiah 53. Just going through the theological deepness of the text. What did he do? He tells him the gospel. He tells him what he needs to hear so he can understand what Isaiah 53 is saying. Because... That's talking about Christ, the, 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 the Son of God who's led to the slaughter for, for you and me. And so this is really an awesome uh, text as he's sitting with them and he's saying, you know, hey, who, who is this uh, uh, about? And, and Philip is saying, man, this is about Jesus. This is about your Savior and Lord. And then, as they're going, you can see the eunuch believes. Because he's saying, what's preventing me from being baptized? Like, I, and, and notice, remember, where are they at? They're on a desert road. They're, they're in the desert. I don't know about you, but when I've been in the desert, it's kind of hard to find water. And what happens? Well, God's hand of providence once again, because here's a desert road. And all of a sudden, there's water for a baptism. I mean, that's amazing. And so the eunuch goes, hey, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Well, I mean, nothing. Nothing at all. And, and he's kind of saying, hey, I mean, I should be baptized, right? I mean, this is, I, I, I believe. I, I, I believe in, in Jesus, my Savior. And so they command the chariot to stop. They went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And it says when they, uh, and so here, here, let's look at this first before I move forward. Um, you know, when somebody asks to be baptized, the only thing you need to tell them <laughs> is you realize that this, you're saying Jesus is my Savior, that you believe that, and that you are desiring the forgiveness of sins that Jesus gives you through the power of his water and his word, right? Yes, then let's do it, right? We don't have to wait uh, for a long time to, to baptize people. We don't have to educate them for two years to baptize them. When they believe Jesus is Savior and they are a sinner in need of forgiveness, then we baptize them. And that's exactly what Philip did here. Um, and so... Um, you know, there's commentators in baptism that talk about, and as Lutherans, you know, well, was he immersed? Did water just get poured out? You know, it was the desert. I mean, how much water? It seems to indicate, you know, they went down into the water, but does that mean they leaned down and then they put it on their head? Look, here's the deal. Uh, some of you may be asking or wondering the question, um, hey, um, which mode of baptism is, is most effective or is right? And the reality is it doesn't matter how you're baptized as, as long with the way the water is on you. So whether you're sprinkled, whether you're dipped in a, in a body of water, the, the only thing that matters is that the person baptizing, and preferably for um, order, good order, that a, a pastor is doing it, that you hear these words. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. While the water, you're either in it or it's being on you. It, it, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, outside of that. Now, if somebody was saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the balls and of uh, my uncle because I don't really believe in the spirit. That's a whole different thing. It has to be the water and the word together. But how much water 
or whatever, you know, if you're in a desert place, if you were on a mission trip and some, one of your friends that was with you who wasn't a believer when they came, but now you've had the opportunity to share the gospel and they stop all of a sudden as you're walking to the project y'all are working on and they go, you know what? I believe in Jesus, my savior, and I want to be baptized. And you had nothing but some water in your water bottle. You could do that. I mean, you know, um, it's, it's, as you are doing it, you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So that's what happens. Um, this eunuch is baptized, and then something crazy happens. We have already seen an angel, right? Something more happens. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all towns. So here's what's happening. This is crazy. Just, he was almost like transported or some, some way. So you had an angel, and now the eunuch's like, wow, Philip, man, that is so awesome. I can't believe I'm a follower of Christ. You know, this is really cool. And he turns around, and he's like, Philip? Anybody see where Philip went? Where did he go? He's gone. Like he's just he's just gone. And, and and that's just the way it is. He was just he's all of a sudden just boop gone. And one moment he's with the eunuch. That the next moment he's vanished into thin air. Um, well, and then what happens? Well, he ends up at this Azotus. I have no idea where that is. Geography is not a spiritual gift for me. I know where Texas and Tennessee are, and that's and Italy. That's pretty much about all you need to know right there, right? I mean, that's all that matters. I guess if you're from another state or country, maybe, but for me, those are, those are good. And so it says he preached the gospel to all towns until he came to Caesarea. This is amazing that you have, um, you have Philip doing this. Well, now... You have um, chapter 9 happening, but we are going to stop right there today, and we're going to start chapter 9 hopefully next week on um, Zoom. Uh, again, I apologize for the, for the uh, technical difficulties. We will start next week, Acts chapter 9. You can um, just check that out. Uh, next week, I'll send that link out again. And so I pray all of you have a good week. Uh, that uh, y'all are staying healthy and strong. And um, if things have opened up for your job, hopefully back to work again. And just hopefully we're getting in some sense of uh, rhythm and consistency. But um, let us know if y'all need anything, and we will see you soon.